more for the second time today i'm phil pemberton this time around i've got something a little bit special for you a few of you many of you some of you will have noticed uh, in the past couple of weeks that the riscos 3.71 source code uh, made it out onto the open internet and there was a little bit of a star dot thread about uh, that coming out where you can get it answer is it's on github um I'll drop the link in the chat at the end of this, unless Arcadian beats me to it. Uh, hint, hint. So what I'm going to do for this one is, this is a little bit of a demo on building the thing, getting a ROM image out of it. Then at the end, I'll open up for ideas on what we could actually do with this, what changes we could make, what improvements we could make to the, uh, to the RISC OS. And uh, we'll go from there. So I've just fired up RPCMU uh, for this. The directory here, um, what I've done, uh, as you can see from the .git directory there, is I've just git cloned the GitHub repository into the hostfs directory for this RPCMU instance. So RPCMU slash host fs and you run git clone git repository directory uh, sorry git repository url from there and it creates a directory called ro3 underscore 71 which contains riscos free source code um and also sets the file types appropriately for rpcmu uh, there's a very helpful little readme file which i've got on the right here which uh, the folks at Acorn very kindly left us to tell us how we actually build the thing. But it's nowhere near as difficult as it could have been. We've not had to do any real guesswork, just a bunch of file renaming. Uh, and indeed, there's some documentation on the changes that were made in RISCOS 3.70 and 3.71 uh, for the strong arm releases and for the, uh, um, the, what, the 3.71, which was on the A7000 and added arm 7000 fe processor support so we've done all the unzipping and so forth copying it into this tree that's all part of the git export we don't need to worry about that so we've got a file a couple of environment files here uh and the four is the one that we want that builds a four megabyte rom image uh suitable for a risk pc and we're going to build sys Morris 4, double click config, and that generates a make file for us. And then we run make clean, which will sit spinning for a little while and remove all the pre built files and any uh, leftovers that might be left from the last build. Strictly speaking, if you've just checked this out of Git, this shouldn't be necessary, but it doesn't hurt to do it anyway. Um, the interesting thing about this source dump, as some of you might have noticed, or this source release, I should say, is that uh, it actually includes quite a few things uh, like ShareFS, which aren't included in the RISCOS open uh, public drop. So... Um, while you can get most of this by checking it out of the RISCOS open uh, Git repositories or previously the CVS repositories, you couldn't get things like ShareFS. You'd have quite a cut down uh, RISCOS free. And indeed, it was missing the build script, so you couldn't have built it anyway. Um, this is a complete package, including the tools needed to build it. So we've cleaned the... Uh, We've cleaned the, uh, the build directories. Uh, and now we're not going to worry about a hard disk build. Um, that's not really of interest at the moment. 
uh, build this Morris fort and then make system. We'll start building the entire operating system. So this takes a, a wee while to run. You can see it building all the different modules that comprise RISCOS. So you've got the usual suspect, Sprite Extend, Squash, uh, the shared C library taking a wee bit longer than usual. Uh, PC card FS is an interesting one. Um, there are some of <laughs> quite a few interesting modules here that look like they were left over from the stock laptop. So it's uh, uh, it may be uh, of interest for someone to have a dig through this and see what uh, what that tells us and whether we could emulate that on our PC MU like the Phoebe was. Um, battery manager as well. That was from the A4 laptop, we believe. Might have had some changes in the interim. So there's a possibility that we could take little bits of this and um, perhaps backport them to RISCOS 3.1. Um, things like the battery manager could potentially be improved for A4 laptops. Um, so Besides ShareFS, there is also the Acorn Replay source code in here, or at least the decompressor side of it. Uh, so for those who don't know, Replay was Acorn's full motion video um, package that came out roughly around the same time as the RISC PC. There were some quite famous demos where it was playing uh, videos of space shuttle launches at uh, Acorn World and Acorn user shows. Um, so you can poke at that and see how it was put together. Quite surprisingly, the majority of it is BBC Basic. So it's um, potentially quite easy for someone who knows the language to dig into it and um, have a stare and have a poke around. So while that's continuing to build in the background, I am actually going to show you some of the structure of the build system. Uh, so we have the applications directory. Come on. It's going a little slow because it's, uh, there we go. So you have some little applications that came with this. I honestly don't know what they do. Add to the star dot uh, thread if you figure it out. Build sys, as its name suggests, contains parts of the build system for the operating system. So you can build things like the operating system utility floppies, which were last done for RISCOS 3.1, hard disk image, uh, the replay floppy disk, ROM releases, uh, soft loadable versions of the ROM as well. And Again, a readme file for that. Which I'd love to load, but I'm losing mouse clicks furiously. Yeah, so you can see there it loads a four megabyte ROM image. Boot it off the drive, uh, boot off the hard drive with whatever risk or version you have, and you soft load to load your uh, newly generated ROM image. You can also drop it in with an emulator, RPCMU, and use it as the boot ROM. The main thing that's interesting about this, though, or will be of interest to most people, is the uh, sources directory. So again, this is chopped up into a million different little categories. So you've got the applications on the system, things like Alarm, Bookworm, which is the cut down version of Acorn Browse, Replay, so AR Player, Change FSI, Maestro, all the standard applications that uh, come with a uh, RISCOS 3.71 system. There's the Acorn Replay Encoder. Uh, which I believe includes source code. The games, demos, diversions. The network stack is in here. So that's in networking. Come on, which includes two versions of AUN, BBC Econet, uh, what appears to be the broadcast loader, uh, the Econet module, Net Status, Net Utils 2, 
Now, I know there's been a patch done to fix some uh, bugs in the Econet module. Um, I believe one of them is a heap corruption bug, so I would be uh, quite interested in uh, uh, making contact with the person who did that and uh, finding out what was done to fix it. And then some, some networking utilities in there as well. The majority of the operating system is in OS core. Come on. And follows this same kind of general structure. So you have a batch file, that, a task obey file that cleans, compiles, builds a debug version, uh, prepares for release and makes a release of whatever this is. You have a directory for the object files, the assembly source, C source, module headers, excuse me, header files, linked output, map files, resource files, and so on and so forth. So all the, the source code is there and relatively easy to uh, find and pick apart. HW support is hardware support. Uh, so things like drivers for the hardware. Um, so ARM and ARM free processor support, battery manager, CD-ROM drivers, IO module driver, I square C, PCMCIA again I think is probably from the stock portable module for the A4 SCSI drivers serial port uh, support serial mouse driver and I'm starting to get errors from the uh, sorry warnings from the build process now as it gets into the networking stack There we go. What you tend to find are things like the uh, driver modules are written mostly or entirely in ARM assembler. Um, actually getting quite tempting to close my screen share and load up another uh, RPC MU if you could bear with me what I'll do is while we do the source code explore I will share in fact I'll share the entire desktop So what we, just to give some ideas of things we could do, um, there have been patches done to HForm, hard disk formatter in the past. We have what appears to be the entire uncrunched source code to that, including all the comments that got stripped out as part of the release process. So I'm aware people have done patches without that, but we could potentially add support for perhaps in, uh, adding support for larger drives, which would be changes to ADFS, potentially file core um, and hard disk formatter. We could potentially have a RISCOS 3.71 with some of the changes that are in the uh, rural mainline branch. So um, long file name support is a potential uh, possibility. Larger hard disks, smaller LFAU, smaller um, access unit. There are several patches and make files for said patches kicking around that I haven't honestly dug into. Joystick calibration utility, system resources. So these are all your, for instance, these are the builds for 
a variety of the data tables, replay users, uh, decompressors, uh, 16YUV is a uh, with the video formats, replay supports, uh, build the decompressor, loads of comments on how the decompressor module works. And again, basic source code for the replay player. Still building on the other screen. So you get the idea of the kind of depth of what's hit, what's actually in here. Um, we appear to have what, uh, what seems to be share FS pre-access plus as well. So if you're into the, uh, we've got um, what was uh, access plus Python was written a while ago, which gives a Linux PC the ability to uh, share files or access a file server for a RISCOS machine. So we've net with the access and share FS source code that's in here, we can perhaps get a little better idea of how that works, document it, pick it apart. I'm not certain whether there's much, much sort of life left in it at this point, uh, but it is useful to have it to be able to share files between the risk of three to 3.7 to 4.0 machines across an Econet or uh, an Ethernet network. I don't think we're going to see that finish today. It does seem to be taking a lot longer than it usually does. When that completes, uh, you've got the option of building a hard disk image. So that's a uh, effectively an installation image like uh, was on Acon's FTP site uh, some years ago for basically the hard disk image of a brand new machine. Uh, so they go into the install directory when they've been built and you get hard disk four, which is all the applications uh, and so forth that have been, you know, we're going on the hard disk on a new machine. Images is where the ROM image sits when it's finished building, which is a, in this case, a four meg RISCOS ROM image with the self-test code at the beginning. And I was hoping the credits would be at the end. I suspect those are added, uh, those were added by the persons involved as a later step prior to those being released to manufacture. So you can take that and the instructions are in the readme to split that in two. And you use a tool called, there is a tool called iSplit included in here somewhere, probably in the library directory. I think, yeah, there you go, iSplit, which will split the ROM image into two, uh, two megabyte images that you can then program into a pair of, I think they're two 7C320 EEPROMs, uh, which will then go into a, um, into a RISC PC and, the, the ROM will just boot from, uh, the OS will just boot from ROM. Uh, there's some stuff in here about building the, um, uh, rebuilding a ROM image. So if you've done one full build, you can make small changes to the ROM and build things without having to make a complete new build. And it tells you here how to do that. And uh, apparently it's also possible to build a two megabyte ROM image. Um, so this could be useful if we try to backport this to 
uh, risk uh, normal sort of Archimedes machines that would normally have run RISC-OS 3.1 uh, or earlier. Uh, there's probably going to be a lot of work necessary to cut this back and the success of any endeavor along those lines uh, is going to depend largely on how much the RISC-OS 3.7 code has changed between 3.1 and 3.7 and I suspect the answer is probably a lot. Uh, so a lot of things. Uh, there's a, a trend in the code to just if zero old code uh, rather than completely removing it. So there's probably be quite a few cases where we have to, uh, anyone doing that would have to identify which of those code blocks they would have to re-enable um, rather than having you uh, sit through this. What I'm going to do is grab that 4 meg ROM image. So that is hostfs. I'm going to I'm going to grab that ROM image and then I will grab that 4meg.fe5 and to run this under RPCMU, pop it in the ROMs directory and then what I will do is just settings configure. I'm going to forget how you set the ROM image name on this. Contain risk of storms off file. RPC.CF. Is it that? This is one of those things I don't have to do very often, and it's disappointing that I don't remember how to do it. There we go. Apparently the answer is it loads the first one in the directory. So there you go. That's our RISCOS 3.7 ROM image. You might have noticed earlier that this was running RISCOS 4. That's where the error messages on boot came from. Uh, this is a RISCOS 4 boot structure and hard disk image. <clears throat> Excuse me. So understandably, RISCOS 3.71 doesn't have some of the features that uh, RISCOS 4 boot is expecting from us, uh, or is expecting to have on the system, but we still have the usual boot, boot structure and configuration tools that you would see in a 3.71 machine, including the networking, TCP IP, memory configuration, and so forth. So uh, this is, as you might have noticed, this is definitely not the RISCOS 4 configuration utility. And that is definitely not RISCOS 4 uh, logo in the corner there. I'll shut that down and get rid of that. And I will copy my original CMOS back. And hopefully disable that one. So there's a lot of scope for experimenting with this under emulation. All the files you need are there. You can see here, the, as we've been playing around with the output ROM file from the last build, this is now finished here. You get uh, install ROM complete, all done, Saturday, 6th of February. So it tells you the date and time it finished. And then, as I showed you earlier, the output ROM file is in install images. And you can use iSplit to split that up into a uh, ROM image that you can flash into an EEPROM.
uh, if you have an EEPROM programmer or you just use the formag image as is in RPCMU. So I think that's everything I wanted to show off with this. So what I'm going to do now is turn this over to questions, but also ask if anyone has any <clears throat> any ideas for things we could do with the RISCOS 3.71 source code. If you can pop those in the chat and we'll make a note of them and read them out. Um, so I'm, there has been a thread on Stardot about this, but there hasn't been a lot of activity beyond, ooh, that's shiny. So it'd be nice to uh, see what we could do with what is the last true ACORN release of RISCOS uh, for the RISC PC platform. And indeed any ACORN platform prior to uh, RISCOS 4 being released in the 2000s. Arcadians dropped the link in there uh, for RISCOS 3.71 drop. It's on the Stardot uh, GitHub uh, page. So if you go to github.com slash Stardot, there's a repository there called RISCOS 371. Slight correction from Brian. Uh, replay came out long before the RISC PC. I had it running on an A3000. I first saw it on the RISC PC, so sorry for getting that wrong. I, I knew it came with, um, with the RISC PC. So next question, what does file call look like? Uh, hopefully you can all see RPC MU. So this is sources, OS core, file sys, and you can see file core here. And there's a bunch of source files. These are all .s, so these are ARM assembly language. The top level file pulls in uh, a variety of uh, additional files. So you've got file core 0, 5, 45, and these implement a variety of things like start of module. What does 30 do? Useful routines. So they all, generally speaking, have a little title at the top or a uh, header to uh, tell you what they do. Um, ADFS 45 OS files, so these will be implementing the OS files wise, help text for the module, make files. Um, I don't think there is any C code for this. Uh, version file, tests, Lord only knows what these do, I certainly don't. And then some tools to so file IO basher disk record. So these are debugging tools for the um, for the uh, file core system, and apparently a disk fixer. So Acon had their own internal. Oh, it was C. So there is a C file to go with it. Uh, what was it called? Emaps appears that Acon had their own internal disk fixing tool prior to Sergio Menisi's uh, FDisk and, uh, sorry, FSCK and the later, uh, oh, what was that, Disk Doctor and uh, Disk Knight, of course. That was what I was trying to remember. How long does it take to build if you get rid of the tasker base and run the build single tasking? Don't know. Exercise to the reader. Try it and tell me. Did a lot of work on disk caching back in the day. Would that be worthwhile? I can imagine disk caching might speed the build up. But I'm not sure if that's the context you meant that, Dominic. Adding, if you mean in terms of adding... Usability. I, I did some experiments and it was a horrible hack with um, intercepting the, the native like SWI vector between file core and whatever the, I can't remember what the modules were now. But file it, core, file switch, ADFR. Yeah, so in between one of those two, I can't remember which two. And it, it made it a lot quicker to do a lot of things like booting and stuff like that, but it was a an awful hack and it was really flaky. But if you right. put that in file core, I think it, I just don't know if, it, if it's running on RPCMU, I'm, I'm guessing it goes as fast as a, the host disk, doesn't it? It does on this one, yeah. This is a solid state disk, so it's going to be running like a scalded hair. 
Yeah, I just wonder uh, if, how many people use real hardware and real discs and because you, um, if you're on a real like ST five hundred six disc or something, it'd probably make the make it worthwhile. That would be. I can see it being very useful for an Archimedes for exactly that reason. I don't think many people would use ST five hundred sixes, but certainly, I know a few people still use it. Myself included, still use the spinning Rust IDE drives. And there is a certain amount of speed to be gained from compact flash cards. I think perhaps because of the speed of the IDE interface on the motherboard, if you're using that, rather than the speed of the drive itself, because obviously a CF card is going to have effectively a zero seek time or zero as near as down it compared to a hard disk. Yeah, and I worked it out as a transfer times because the pod you'll sort of throttle. Yeah, yeah it's um, N megahertz uh, pod bus and slower if the pod demands it. Uh, so I can see disk caching being very, very interesting, even if it doesn't have a a massive benefit on risk pc spec hardware or more certainly it, it probably won't have a lot on a heavily upgraded risk pc um, i can see it being useful for uh the, the more retro configured machines i have a second risk pc for instance the Huston eagle m2 um that is quite bare compared to the strong arm under my desk and the purpose with that was to keep the os quite old and maintain compatibility with all the software. Um, so I could see it being useful on a machine like that. For me personally, I'd like to see the large RAM disk support that um, RISC-OS 4 had and large dynamic areas um, because that's useful with the Eagle card again because you can just use the whole RAM as a video recording uh, yeah. disk. Um, and that helps a lot because the thing that tends to kill a video capture is the disk I.O. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, the drive it's slows to... down, and I can see caching helping that too. I don't want to hijack what you're doing, so it's great, by the way. Um, mm. no, but even on the the RPC I bought secondhand, somebody that had really top spec for the time, SCSI hard disk, the caching made a difference. Yeah. If, uh, most of the difference was that it crashed and... You have to refund the hard disk, but <laughs> I can imagine if it's added to uh file core correctly. I mean, there is ADFS buffers, yeah, but the, the oh, ADFS that's... buffers are really crap the way, the way they're implemented, they reread you everything. Beat every time. <laughs> <laughs> you beat me to it, yeah. Um, more intelligent disk caching would be a good thing. I don't know if if that's on the rule branch of RiskOS. Um, yeah, I, I, I gave up looking at it. The code looked even more sort of convoluted than that. Any, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop going it's, about my bit. And... It's had a great many... How do you put it? A great many thumbs in the pie, as it were. A lot of people have played around with it and left their mark on it. I'm going to have a dig around the code. I don't know how many of you have been following the Postbox project. Myelin uh, has been working on that started from finding the source code for the RISCOS power on self test and the protocol documentation in one of the old Acorn service manuals. But that code is actually sat here. Um, so if you want to see what the RISCOS startup code looks like, how the system boots up, there's quite a lot here. So it, it does things like checking. This is actually a perfect example of some of the platform test code that I mentioned earlier. It's checking to see whether the ROM is being built for a machine with an IOMD, so a, a risk PC. And if it's not, well, different set of variables. You know, video physical memory is there. Physical space is this big. ROM is at this address. Physical RAM space starts here. And the comments you know, it's for a MC1. <clears throat> Uh, 
RISCOS MEMC setup code. Let's XIO. RISCOS 2 post external commands. So this is doing things like a test adapter interface, literally the post box. Um, so it uh, gives you a nice description of how the how a RISCOS system talks to the test adapter. Vectorize, perhaps a silly question, but I'm just curious, does this build process build just for 4 meg OS ROM, but also a lot of other files that are soft loaded? If you wanted to add new features to the current build, would they fit inside 4 meg? Would you have to remove something else to fit or would you just create a new module that was soft loaded? Any or all of the above, the current ROM, that line there, tells you where it's starting to fill the ROM with zeros. And right at the end here, it's telling you that you have uh, there are 5BF 10 bytes, which is, I spell it right. A lot. It's about 376K of uh, spare space on that ROM. So if you wanted to build something into the ROM, my suggestion would be to build it to soft load to start with so you can debug it. And then when you've got it working pretty well, um, add it to the ROM. Uh, if you watch how the build proceeds, this uh, there will be, uh, there's a description file somewhere that specifies what goes in the ROM and in what order. Um, Big Split is the tool that uh, that builds the ROM image, and then you can see there ROM Morris. Excuse me. <clears throat> it's asking for the MOS image file file to save and a list of. I assume for Big Split is the file that it's taking in to describe uh, what goes in the ROM and how. So you would just add a line to the end of that to say, well, I want you know, my patch module there, or I want my uh, my disk cache adding to that, and it would just be built into the ROM. Uh, so you wouldn't have to remove anything provided your ROM, uh, so your module that you were adding was less than about uh, 370K, probably 300K to be safe. Um, you could conceivably add if you really wanted to you could probably add the jpeg file of the acorn team to the rom um, and have some kind of secret key combination to make it display as there's a lot you could add to this and of course it's sat in the rom so with it being in the rom it doesn't occupy any space in the rma in the module area it's just going to load it in uh, execute it in place um, which is another point that's worth coming on to because you have to be careful writing uh, modules that run from ROM. Obviously, you don't, because you're not loaded into the RMA the, and you're executing from ROM, you can't make any changes inside the ROM's code itself. So self-modifying code is right out and really should not be done in the modern age anyway. Besides self-modifying code, things like uh, writing to the module's own area as a workspace, you have to do it the proper way. You have to use OS module to get a piece of workspace memory and, and work in there. You save it to R10 or something like that, and it's uh, after you do the, OS, uh, the module initialize, and then RISCOS will keep passing you the workspace pointer. Uh, you, you have to do it that way. Basically, follow Acorn's lead. Brian's just commented that the RISCOS 4.3 soft load ROMs was 6 meg. So that's select and adjust. So unless you're planning to burn actual ROMs, the size doesn't really matter. Yeah, if you're soft loading these, you would have to possibly fix soft load so that it can uh, work with larger ROMs, uh, create new spec files for the ROMs, pad them out to 6 megs. I can't actually remember offhand what the largest ROM a RISC PC can take is. It might even be eight megabytes. I don't know. I don't know offhand. Certainly four megabytes because that's the size of the stock ROMs. 
I do recall that the A4000 can take a two or a four megabyte ROM. And the, the issue with four megabyte ROMs is that you can't have risk loss modules in the upper segment, so the upper two megs. Uh, but you can use it as an extension module, a fifth column ROM. Um, and that was how I stuck Wizzo in the ROM of my A4000. Um, so, yeah, check the risk PC schematics. But I would imagine that if Acorn were expecting two and four megabyte ROMs when the risk PC was replaced, that re was released, sorry, that it's there's a good likelihood that it probably supports eight meg ROMs. The adjust ROMs were four meg and decompressed parts of themselves into the RAM. So the risk PC only went to four meg. It's possible that they just couldn't get eight meg chips. Uh, is the other the other aspect or eight meg chips with the right pin out. Proving or disproving anything I've just said is left as an exercise to the listener. I don't have the risk PC schematics to hand at the moment. I've done enough risk PC repair for the last 12 months. I'm just glad mine works thanks to the uh, the two new RAM sticks. Oh, and the board full of capacitors. Um, any more questions? I'm still taking questions. In fact, there is a blue light special on in our questions department. Feel free to ask. Uh, all your suggestions will be listened to and noted. <clears throat> do, do you think there's, this is likely to get forked from rule? I think it already has been, to be fair, by releasing it. Yeah, but I mean seriously. I mean, as a as a a project for lots of people, because rules never st struck me as being friendly to me. It's always been a bit over the top, and this just seems like yay, we can all pile in. <laughs> Kids in a sweet shop with uh, a blank check. Yeah. Um, it opens up the opportunity to do a lot of things with risk offs that were impossible before. Chief to that would be things like modifying share FS or digging into how that works. We just didn't have the code before. Acon replay, same again. We can look at how replay was put together, learn a lot from it. But also, it opens up the whole 26-bit branch of RISCOS for public involvement. The rural branch of RISCOS is a fantastic achievement, but I see it as, I guess, the future of RISCOS in a 32-bit context. So it's really good for putting on a Raspberry Pi and showing RISCOS to people who have never seen it before, who might have used it in school and just want to play around with it. Put aim your law on there. And you've got a lot of 26-bit software available to you. But what it doesn't give you is an upgrade path for RISC PCs. Because if you put RISCOS 5, which is the rule branch, on a RISC PC, most modules don't have 32-bit drivers available. Most network cards don't have 32-bit drivers available. Yeah. The core platform hardware, yeah. Go go and do as you will. That was in the RISCOS source tree. It's, uh, it, it will work with the base hardware, but if you expand it, a lot of things are going to stop working. A lot of software is going to stop working. And I don't think I don't think Emulor is actually available for the RISC PC in that context. I don't think there was much effort really as uh, done to the rule branch, uh, the sorry, the rule. IOMD branch. Um, so I think if people want to maintain software compatibility with old 26-bit software, this gives us a lot of options to do that, to fix bugs in 3.71, to fix things that have been annoying us for ages. But it's not the future in the sense that the rural branch is. No, I mean, they seem to be aiming at, but, you know, they've got their aim. Whereas... Yeah. And it's quite orthogonal to people who like old computers. Hmm. I mean, backporting some of this stuff to 
an A3000 or an A400 would be great. ENS, risk PC ROM sockets are A0 to A19, so support 4 meg. Is that 4 megabytes per ROM or 4 megabytes total? 2 to the power of 20, 2 to the power of 4 meg total. 24 bits. A0 to A19 on the ROM sockets or LA2 to LA21 if you count that way. Yeah, so it's 22 bits, which is 4 meg times, it's a word wide ROM. Uh, each one is word wide, so it's 32 bits. But because you're using, yeah, because you're using the LA21 notation, it's 22 bits if you were byte addressing. Yeah, so it's four megabytes total. I wonder how much is actually mapped into the address space. Hmm. That's me thinking, I wonder if there's somewhere you could steal LA22 from and uh, whether there is actually enough space in the address map to do a eight meg ROM. The other option would be to uh, do something a little bit like Arc Flash and uh, have a paging register on there, then you would have to pick up reset from somewhere to uh, to reset the ROM back to the um, the initial two, uh, what would it be, two megs. That would be a, a fun project for someone, but perhaps not me. When you were looking at the postcode, there was something about the address lines used, it said it enabled one or two above the normal one. It does, yes. So um, LA23 is the one that's used on the post connector, isn't it? So you've yes. got LA22 that should be usable. Yes. I think it's wired to a pin. Going from memory of the schematics, I think LA22 is actually on the data side of the ROM on the schematic and is wired up to a no connect pin. And on an eight meg ROM, that no connect pin would be A20. So the other possibility there is that the, there are three revisions of the RISC PC motherboard and the schematics are only public for the first revision with 8-bit sound. I know for a fact that Acorn added an extra floppy drive select line to the Mark 3. I don't know if Mark 2 had that same modification, um, but the Mark 3, uh, the Mark 3, issue 3, the heck did they call that? It's Crichton or Rimmer, the, the latest 16-bit sound board that went out in the strong arm risk PCs in the 700s and the um, J233s, not only had 16-bit sound, but also had a differently wired 16-bit audio header. I know because I've had to make a cable for the Eagle to, to use that. And also could have changes in the wiring of the ROM sockets to allow it to use an eight megabyte ROM. So it might be possible to run this on real hardware, but you would need either a carrier board that picks up the address line from a jumper or a resistor or some point on the board, or you would need a later revision motherboard that wouldn't need the carrier board, assuming that's what Acorn did. This is one of those moments where I would love for the contents of the RISC PC filing cabinet, uh, but especially the schematics in Acorn's old drawing room, to fall through a subspace wormhole and land in my living room. Um, because you can bet if they did, the first thing that would happen is the Mark III schematic would be sat online, and I would be sat poring over it for the differences, uh, as all of my RISC PCs are that revision. I have one of the newer schematics. Uh, I have a bits of it. Um, the ROMs are on that. 
are still, uh, you only still get the same uh, LA21. Oh, that's a shame. I don't know if this is issue two or three schematics. Um, The drawing number would give it away. uh, Slash C. I mean, it looks like LA-22 would be fairly easy to pick up, and pin 32 is just pulled high on the ROMs, so it's probably that. Yeah, uh, 32 would be power. They're 32 pin ROMs. Um, BHE is pulled high. Bite high enable. Mm -hmm. So that's where you probably find the the extra address bit from. Hmm. It depends. This is uh, this is getting into the realms of I would need to be looking at the data sheet. I think slash C. The giveaway with the the revs the issue three board was that its part number began twelve oh eight, if I remember oh. rightly. So the drawing <laughs> schematic, the drawing number would probably begin 12.08 for the issue three schematic. I mean, these are issue two then, because these are 197 slash uh, 00 slash C. Uh, 0197 would be either an issue one or an issue two board. Yeah, You're thinking of eight bit ROMs, they're not 32 bit, 32 pin chips. Bit chips. They're 42 at least. You know what? I've got some sat on my desk. It's nice to have a prop. M27C320 is a 4 megabyte by 8, 32 megabit EEPROM. You can wire the 8 and 16 bit. Um, You can wire each byte together and use the byte enables to use it as an 8 bit ROM which is what ST are getting on about here in the title. You can use it as 16-bit wide, or you can use it as uh, 8-bit wide. But why you would use one of these as 8-bit wide is beyond me. They say it's available in TSOP 48. I'm sat here with uh, dual inline package ones. I I have to uh, guess that they were uh, obsolete by the time uh, they came out. If they were 44 pins SOIC, uh, all right, the VCC is sat on pin 23. That seems weird. Sure, I've seen it. But for the T top, it probably is because they're all rotated slightly. Yeah. It's uh, bonded out differently, isn't it? Hopefully the circuit diagram, they don't actually tell you the pin numbers on the ROMs. <laughs> that little bit is... Dip 24, I don't believe that for a second. 322 dip. These are actually 320s, aren't they? If I misread the part number. in cellar tape. So were you talking of pulling off LA-22 from the post, post connector? Probably That's could. LA-23. Right, I'm wrong. These are 27C322s, which is the, um, which is why I'm not finding what I expect. And these actually are still available. Uh, 2 meg by 16. And the reason you can use the 322 is because the RISC PC um, only uses them in 16 bit mode. The difference between the 320 and the 322 is that these don't have the byte enables. Um, but yeah, 42 pins. And you have A19 up there uh, and an A20 on pin 32. So if pin 32 is wired high, then the way you would get an 8 meg ROM working in a RISC PC is to lift pin 32 or put this on a carrier board 
um, and then pick it off of the post header or somewhere else that has it. I don't know if the post header gives you... LA23, the... so that would be a gap in the, in the memory space. So you would what you could accommodate that in the code uh, by one thing you could do is have that work as a um, fifth column ROM, a 32 bit fifth column ROM. So the same trick that I did with the A4000. Um, and it should find that provided the module module is adjusted accordingly. The other way to go about it would be to pick LA22 off a resistor pack or something. Or, um, yeah, you can get it off RP3, it looks like it's fairly easy to find. Yeah. Okay, well, if it's on RP3, there you go. Let's find out which side it's on, which side and which pin. It's, um, it's not going to be anywhere near as easy as it was on the. I was going to say with the carrier boards in the A series machines, but they required soldering as well. So I'm just going to, you know, tell my failing memory to shut up for a second on that one. For some reason, I thought the carrier board was solderless. I must be thinking about something else. The, the Watford VidC uh, expander was. I've been looking at those the other day. Yeah, there's so a, a standard, um, a standard ROM would be a two seven C one sixty. So that's four megabytes total ROM space. And not that I advise you do this. One could possibly take an image of an adjust ROM and copy it onto one of those EPROMs. Um, I would actually like to know what they did with adjust. Uh, it's the decompression side of things. because I don't think that's in the rule source tree. It would be quite useful if we get into the realms of putting large amounts of stuff into the RISCOS ROM. But um, as a baseline, we could potentially pull in file store, no. uh, file store, file switch um, and ADFS from the rural branch and see if it works, which would open up the door to uh, things like long file names. Uh, the what is it, ADFS F and F plus disk formats would be opened up as a result of that. Don't know if it would build. Someone try it and find out. Are you just yeah. thinking for the sort of risk PC hardware? Yeah. Right. Because obviously you can't do any decompression on an Archimedes. You just haven't got enough RAM available. Yeah, exactly. You would have to do everything from ROM on an Archimedes. And that was, again, the beauty of the four meg uh, fifth column hack. It's two megabytes that is execute in place. Uh, so you couldn't put something like vProtect in there because it, um, it assumes its workspace is writable. But you could put um, for things like driver modules in there, WISO. Um, you could have applications which loaded themselves into resource FS. Um, you could effectively have an A4000 or a RISC PC with all the software you need on a day to day basis shoved into resource FS, which would be an interesting kind of um, option. Uh, because you could then, you could if, you could have diskless risk PCs that booted from the network and change the default, um, or they wouldn't even need to boot from the network. You would change the. Um, what do you do? You would uh, you'd have to run set station on them to set the station number, but AUN would. You could change the default CMOS settings so the default boot source was AUN for instance, and have net booting risk PCs. It's like Topcat, but done like at operating system level. Or oh, ClassNet, that was a similar thing, wasn't it, from Oak? I've just checked on issue three. That doesn't have the extra address line either. Ooh. It's 
surprised you have an issue free risk PC motherboard schematic. Can I have a copy, please? Uh, <laughs> it would, it would, um, it I'll would reduce any specific questions on it, but that's as far <laughs> as I'll go. Oh, I think I figured out the the main difference is a sixteen bit sound, and. Um, So the main difference is a 16-bit sound, that extra floppy drive select. Um, I can't think of a specific question to ask regarding the changes that have been made on that board without actually seeing what the changes are. <laughs> yeah, I um, A lot of what I figured out about that board, I figured out with a multimeter while I was trying to fix a very broken one that turned out to have in a layer... Um, in a layer damage. Oh, well, that's nasty to fix. Mm. Yeah, the um, it's basically unfixable on that board because um, I don't to fix it. I would need the PCB diagrams for the inner layers, and yeah. I would need to figure out which uh, which tracks have broken. Now, I know it's something related to the. Um, it's something between the IOMD and the disk controller, the uh, Super IO, because when it goes, when it works, it works great. Um, when it doesn't work, the whole, everything that the Super IO deals with just disappears. But at this point, I've kind of written that motherboard off. Yeah. Even stuff like the Podual bus and the network port doesn't work properly, so it's probably lost an address line. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't actually. There isn't. There isn't anywhere documented a change log between issue two and issue three. Which has got a new part number. Yeah, it was. Um, from what I can gather, it was a complete redesign of the motherboard. They took the schematics but the board layout is it has the same mechanical uh, anything that was mechanically constrained is in the same place mm. anything they could get away with moving they moved so things like the audio header and the genlock header are quite different uh, the audio header specifically doesn't have unfiltered audio that's now the line in back to the motherboard um the it does have the filtered audio out in fact the way you get an eagle m2 to work is you swap a couple of pins around so it uses the filtered audio and feeds back into the motherboards on the correct pins rather than trying to override the audio yeah. filter like it does on an a5000 yes. which yeah. is disgusting and awful and <laughs> quite frankly not future proof as we found out but it is a nice card just look at uh i think i've run out of things to talk about unless anyone has any last questions and quite honest i quite need a cough sweep because my throat's getting sore anyone else This is a really ignorant question, but we're obviously talking, because I obviously don't know lots about <clears throat> RISCOS, but we're talking right. about the possibility of maybe backporting this in, in, things into 3.1 or possibly getting, um, you know, at, at least getting 3.71 updated on RISC PCs and maybe A5000s. How easy is it to actually get ROMs burnt now? Or is it, can you soft load on anything on an A3000? That's what, you know. Um, you wouldn't be able to soft load on an A3000 because you haven't got enough RAM. And you so also... there you go. So how would you go about if we've, is there a feasible, how common are these ROMs? Yeah. How are the ROM chips? Because the RISCOS ROMs are unusual. Then they're, they're not like the BBC micro ROMs, which you can still get, or are they? Are oh. they quite a common ROM? Well, they're still available. Yeah. You can yeah. get 27C322s and 27C160s okay. on eBay quite easily. So there aren't um, any of the ROMs that chips that were used 20 years ago and or 25 years ago, that 30 years ago, 
can be sourced pretty much and burnt. If they were made that... in their millions, they're still quite okay. Excuse me. Well, how, how come then at one point I remember like a set of Riscos four ROMs was it or a set of Riscos four uh, ROMs was going for always ninety hundred pounds? Was that the the fact that it was a you were buying a licensed copy? Yes. As opposed to that, that's it. You know. Okay. Okay. You can actually buy these ROMs on eBay, as I said. You can get them on AliExpress. Uh, I'm just... So, Mouser are saying they can supply them uh, as an... Ex oh, no, sorry. They're saying they're obsolete. I was going to say uh, extended range, but yeah, stock not available. So, any that would you would buy would be uh, from whatever supplies remain. However, EPROMs were a common part back in the days they were used. These would have been a common one on 32-bit machines. There are probably thousands still out there in the supply chain in various places. And you can obviously still use, you could use Flash if you wanted to. Yeah, there are flash chips at a 16 bit wide that you could use. Oh, I was thinking more um, for the Archimede side of things. Yeah, you can get also applicable. There's uh, Myelin's Arc flash board as well, which is exactly that. It's an in circuit flashable Riscos sure. uh, ROM that just plugs into the motherboard. And that would be what I would probably use for development uh, on the, you know, on the um, uh, Archimedes. Thing is, there are very few things in the ROM that you would have to burn a ROM to try out. You can do a lot of development on this just by um, building the module version of something and sticking it in the boot sequence. In fact, on that front, if you're doing it that way, you've also got options for debugging like sending debug out of the serial port. Or um, if you have a post box connected, you can take a, take control of the post box and uh, send messages to it. So there's a lot you can... There were debug pods for RISCOS. I haven't dug into the source code, but I don't doubt that the debugging stuff is there. To make ROMs, aside from the ROMs, you're going to need something like that. Um, that's an EEPROM programmer and quite an expensive one. I'm pleased to say I didn't pay the full retail price for that thing. Um, it was sold as broken from Farnell on their trade counter when that was still a thing. Um, and it turned out to work fine. So um, you can get the, I think the TL866 will probably program them, but don't take my word from it. Check the device support list. So that's the cheap Chinese EEPROM programmer everyone seems to have. So there's, there's nothing really stopping someone from getting together the parts they need to burn RISCOS ROMs for a RISC PC for uh, probably, I think I paid about £30 for the ROMs uh, for four of them. And you're probably looking about £60 for a TL-866, so you're in the, you're in the uh, £100 ballpark. But if you just want to change some little things here and there and don't mind soft loading, you can always just soft load the bits you're changing unless you're working on the kernel. And then, of course, like I said earlier, my, uh, Arc Flash. Uh, EPRO emulators would be another option. I haven't got mine to hand. Uh, but I've got a USB interface, 16-bit wide one, and I can't remember how big a ROM that can emulate offhand. It was built for another project. Um, but if I built a second one of those and made some adapter boards, that would quite easily uh, work for uh, emulating risk os ROMs. How fast are they accessed? 100 nanoseconds. Uh, the, ooh, good question. That is, is it MEM1 IOMD, basic integrity? There is a bit of code 
that sets the access time of the ROM, and it's right at the beginning of the self-test code. It's one of the first things that gets initialized. Uh, register order, strong arm post, 26-bit motor strong arm. Um, I know 120 nanosecond ones work in the um, A4000. I have 80 nanoseconds somewhere in my mind, but mm, that seems a bit fast. Um, 6594 Crichton will use burst mode ROMs, use 93 nanosecond burst, 156 initial. Now, Crichton, if I remember correctly, was the first revision RISC PC ROM, uh, sorry, RISC PC motherboard. Um, and the second revision, the issue two went under the same code name as a design spin. Um, so I think the expectation is that it will burst access at 93 nanosecond access or 156 nanoseconds wide uh, on the mm. initial access. Practically speaking, you can probably change this little flag here. IOMD ROM CR burst 93 to be, you know, 150 nanoseconds or slower and use slow ROMs. Well, I found I that they, that they will, these ROMs that I'm using, the 27C 322s, will quite happily burst to whatever speed the A4000 uses. I was wondering how hard it would be to use um, a little bit of interface to SPI flash. Uh, in 4-bit mode and use four of those to, to emulate a ROM because four 2 megabit, uh, two megabyte SPI flashes or even one megabyte SPI flashes are dirt cheap. I can see a couple of ways to do that. You can either copy that into RAM on boot. You can use a, a small ROM to contain a bootstrap that loads but effectively soft loads risk us into um into ram from the spi flash on boot like the select bootloader does um and adjust in fact the other thing you could do which would be monumentally harder is have an fpga translating the rom accesses to spi accesses the difficulty there is you only have this 80 nanoseconds, sorry, 93 nanoseconds to go from having the address and the select to having valid data on the data bus. Yes, but that's the burst time. Uh, so you know what that's going to be. Yeah. Um, so the difficult one is the 150. Uh, I'm half wondering whether that's something you can do in a, in a Pico. Um, an RP2040. Please feel free to try. Let us know how you get on. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say very quickly, if you've got very fast EPROMs in there, how much of a performance increase can you get? Not much unless you're accessing ROM. Uh, yeah, but a lot of the OSs run out of ROM. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a fair point. Um yeah, if you put fast ROMs, can you make the, that? How small can you make burst and um, initial? Let's find out. Of course, the RAM was only 16 megahertz, so you're not going to go that much faster, are you? No, not really. That's the bus speed. So. So what would uh, 16 megahertz work out in nanoseconds? Let's find out. Uh, 1 over 16 to the 6th power. 83 nanoseconds, is that it? That rings a bell. Uh, nano, 62 and a half. 62. And... Well, that would explain why it needs 60 nanosecond RAM. 
<laughs> well, 70 works, but 60 is better. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. So. Depending on how, how quickly you can get that, you could actually, for the ROM, have a significant performance increase. Because if you can get it, if you can go down to 62 nanoseconds, um, that's quite a high percentage of an increase of performance. This is going into the realms of the other way you could use SPI flash, which is to hold, because you've got uh, you've got reset on the post connector. So you would have a plug that goes into the post connector and allows you to hold the risk PC in reset until you copy the entire contents <laughs> of the SPI flash into RAM. And then you use ludicrously fast SRAM or uh, SD RAM. Yeah. Um, if you use SD RAM, you have to make sure your maximum refresh um, still allows you to satisfy the access time, or you have to have a pipelined cache to, to keep stuff in there and follow the address bus even when you're not selected. Um, Are you kind of reinventing so... the kinetic card here? <laughs> yeah, I think to be brutally honest, building a strong arm on a card with its own ROM and RAM might be a better idea. <laughs> yes. But also, the, as much as I would love a kinetic, I'm well aware that it is kind of a... Uh, it is a bit of a... Um, I don't want to say solution looking for a problem. It was a great achievement in its time, but it is kind of but perhaps the last gasp of the last machine in the Acorn line. Was well, squeezing every last drop out of a risk PC. Really. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, it was. I don't know. I've heard. I don't know what the reliability of them's like. I've read that the last couple of risk PC boards Castle made up were horribly unreliable. Um, the certainly the Ionix machines haven't held up. They've they've all suffered varying degrees of dead. Um, I know there's a few left, but not many from what I understand. So I'm curious how reliable the kinetic proved to be over time. My, mine's not, mine's not right here. Sorry, a few people talking at once, sir. I said mine's not very. It's a bit flaky. Mm. Yeah, I had a friend who's still using his kinetic, but um, last year, no, actually, year before now, isn't it? Because last year's gone. Um, the motherboard did start to die. And so I just swapped the motherboard and moved his kinetic card across to another, to it. So, yeah. so the kinetic card itself is fine, but the motherboard finally gave up, but hey, 25 years. That's... It's not bad. The motherboards have what are, in my opinion, some quite howling design issues. Um, the main way they fail is in the connection. Either the tracks fail along their length or the tracks fail at the point they join the vias and pads. They don't tend to fail on SMD pads, but they very regularly fail on uh, vias. Um, and in my opinion, the what's known as, I think it's called restring. It's the, the annular ring around the pad that forms the via is too narrow. Um, and if they were going to do pa uh, tracks as narrow as they did, which in a lot of cases they probably didn't need to do on this board, um, they really should have teardropped the pads. And that would have improved the reliability there. They're very susceptible to mechanical shock. If you drop a risk PC motherboard, it is almost certainly not going to work afterwards for exactly the reason I just said. The, the, the through hole via will break away from the, usually the top and bottom layer of the board is what I've seen. Um, from mechanical stress uh, due to the very small annular ring. Just going back to the ROMs, I've just checked uh, IMD data sheet and um, 
you can set the uh, burst down to 62 and a half nanoseconds and the initial access to 62 and a half nanoseconds. Oh, that's nippy. You can, so, get, uh, you can get 30 nanosecond RAM, uh, SRAM. I wonder what Farnell keep in stock. <laughs> this is you are you've given me some horrible ideas here. Well, yeah, um, I mean, if you're going to have to do an adaptable to get your um, extra address bit, you might as well make it give it some performance. And um, it sounds like you're saying if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. <laughs> no, doing properly. <laughs> One man's over, en uh, sorry, one man's done properly is another man's over engineering, as uh, my former boss used to say. And I was routinely accused of over engineering. <laughs> then I did over engineer stuff. <laughs> I, I made mean, stuff that wouldn't that. fail. 10 nanosecond RAM. That's the way I go. Is that, sorry? 10 nanosecond RAM. That's the way I go. Yeah, well. What have we got here? 16 bit wide, one megabit, uh, one mega word, uh, mini BGA, 10 nanoseconds. If you don't mind BGAs, that's the way to go, but that's a little bit small. Um, what have we got in terms? I'm going to guess that they don't let you pick for width, the bus width. No, they don't. So I'm going to have to do. Smallest you could reasonably do is two meg by sixteen. What just uh, two meg by sixteen or four meg by eight? We can use. Uh, also interesting to us would be two meg by thirty six would be interesting because that means you can put all the RAM on one chip. Uh, two meg by eight, one meg by sixteen, four meg by sixteen, or do they have eight? No, it looks like eight, four meg by sixteen looks like the biggest you can get reasonably. <clears throat> so again, we're into the realms of BGAs and TSOPs. Fifty-five nanoseconds they'll go down to. That's fine. Fifty-five nanoseconds. And that's two meg by 16 bits, so you would need two chips and some way of bootstrapping the blasted thing, which probably means an FPGA and something to drag the reset line around. Probably some kind of microcontroller to boot the FPGA. What I am going to say to you is those chips are 37 quid. No, I wouldn't use those. No, 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 no. no. This was going to be cheap. <laughs> Fast SRAM is expensive, especially if you want it big. Now, the BGA ones are cheaper than that. Get, Dominic was helping me the other night with um, trying to route some BGA stuff. Yeah. £3.79, 4 meg by 16 bit, 70 nanoseconds, uh, 1.95 volt. Uh, the difficulty here is voltage level translation. These do not go to uh, get rid of the one volt ones that are just no use. You're going to have to have um, voltage level translation, so you will lose some, uh, you will have some propagation delay with those on both the data path and the address path. So you need to factor in that you will lose twice the propagation delay of the bus translation circuitry, potentially 10 nanoseconds there. So five nanoseconds going in, if you use something like a 74 ABT, one, yeah, six, yeah. two, four, five, five nanoseconds propagation, if it's permanently enabled. 55 nanoseconds, you could do 65 nanoseconds, looking 13 pounds of that, that chip there. That's 3.6 volts, so you're talking translation from 3.3 to 5 volts each way. Um, and um, a 3.3 volt voltage regulator on a carrier board. Probably an FPGA to bootload this. So within the realms of technical possibility, but you're going to need two of these. 
that's 27 quid. Yeah, Plus the FPGA chip, you, you're looking. I would be surprised if you could do it for the south side of 50 quid. So there, exercise for someone who has some spare time during lockdown. One meg by 16, that would be fine for an Archimedes. Uh, so that's a Cypress 7C 1061GE30. You wouldn't need 10 nanoseconds for an Archimedes. Yeah, $40 in single unit, $25.60 in thousand unit budgetary pricing. Uh, nine, nine quid from Digikey. Mm. I'm afraid I'm going to have to bow out now because my throat, as you might be able to tell, is absolutely shot. I need to cross my fingers. I have some strepsils squirreled away somewhere. Well, thanks for all that, Phil. Cheers. Mm -hmm.